Today uh, we have uh, Dr. Uh, Tysty. I said it right, right? Mm -hmm. Yep, all right. <laughs> um, and a uh, little bit about Dr. Tysty. Um, so he graduated with a bachelor's degree from the University of Minnesota, uh, then earned his PhD in theoretical physical chemistry at Montana State University. And then after graduating, he became a research chemist at Gentex Corp in Zeeland, uh, Michigan where he has been credited as an inventor on over 50 U.S. patents. Uh, since the fall of 2016, Dr. Tysty has been an adjunct professor here at GRCC uh, teaching chemistry classes. And uh, today, um, he's going to obviously be talking to us about some color-changing technologies. So uh, looking forward to it. So thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> So color changing technologies. And of course, we've got a bunch of colors up here on the screen. Um, so let, we're going to talk about electrochromism, photochromism, and thermochromism. So let's define some, some, some of these terms. So electrochromism, we're going to call a device or a material that changes color when we apply electrical potential or electrical current. Okay. So those of you who've been thinking about this a little bit can think about oxidation and reduction chemistry. So that's what we talk about when we talk about electrochromism. Photochromism is a change in color when we add light. Photo, photon, chromism, chroma, chromism, color. And thermochromism, the change in color or transmission uh, of a device or a material based on the temperature. So if the temperature changes, the color of the device or the material will change. So electrochromism. Electrochromism is most popular in these devices, uh, these electrochromic mirrors. Uh, about 90% of them are made within 25 miles of where we are standing out in Zeeland, Michigan. Uh, that technology was developed uh, at Gentex in Zeeland. And I have an electrochromic device here. You can see I have a device, it's a window, but you notice the shape and size is about right for a uh, rear view mirror for a car. And if I can get my act together here, and make contact with it, you can see that with just the application of a very small electrical potential, about one volt, a little over one volt, this device is gonna go from transparent to very dark. Now you can imagine that if I have an, a reflector on the back of it, now I've changed the reflectance of, the, of my mirror, which is how these guys work, okay? So, and the other thing to note about this is if I leave it at open circuit, it will clear quite slowly, but if I short it, it will clear much more clear, clearly. And we'll talk about how that happens and why that happens here in a little bit. So that's electrochromism. It's also used uh, in these windows. Where's my clicker? Uh, in these, uh, these are windows for the Boeing 787. Um, Boeing 787 comes equipped with these windows. This window in the transparent state has a transmission of about 65%. In its darkened state, it's less than 0.1% transmission. Actually, much less than 0.1%. So in the darkened state, if you look at the sun, it will look like a full moon. They've attenuated the, the amount of light that goes through that window that much. Um, the other thing that it gets used for, and these are somewhat, this is a somewhat different technology we'll talk about a little bit. Uh, this is a, a window in an atrium kind of an area. If you walked into this room and you walked past that atrium that's right outside, you notice it's kind of warm out there with the sun beating down through those windows. Well, if we could, if somebody could, dim those windows to the point where the light transmission was reduced significantly, you could significantly reduce the amount of air conditioning that has to be run right outside that area. So that's one of the things people are working on. One of the first applications of electrochromism, and it didn't go very well, but was displays. And people are now talking about these flexible displays or reconfigurable paper. So we have, so we can, you can take your you copy your Grand Rapids Press and you can roll it up and you can put it in your pocket and you can electronically change, you know, go from page to page to page, just sort of like your e-reader. So the first 
def, uh, the first discoverer, the first thing known about uh, electrochromism was uh, based on a substance called tungsten trioxide, WO3. So we have a tungsten metal ion along with oxygen. And in this configuration, this window is going to go clear. Because what I'm doing is I'm taking lithium ions and I'm de what they say is deintercalating them. I'm taking them out of the tungsten matrix. If I reverse the current flow, I will put lithium ions into the matrix and then the tungsten will be reduced from tungsten 6 to tungsten 5, right? Because oxygen in an ionic compound has a charge of minus 2. I've got three oxygen, so I have to have tungsten 6. If I add an electron to tungsten 6, make it tungsten 5, I need to put in a lithium ion. You can also do this with hydrogen ions, but then in the tungsten 5, form of this film will darken, become blue, okay? When it's tungsten 6, it's kind of light yellow. So this was the first uh, invent or the first observation of this chemistry, and it was done by Sachin Deb, uh, who is now retired, but for a long time he was out at NREL in Colorado. Now, what happened at Gentex, what happened with these mirrors was different. And it was based on organic chemistry. And it's based on organic redox chemistry. It's known that I can start with this compound. This compound is Prussian blue. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with these angle structures, these angles all represent carbon atoms. There is a hydrogen hanging off of each of these. This is also a carbon atom now with three hydrogens. Uh, I got a nitrogen here, carbon here, carbon here. That compound, it's called Worcester's blue, uh, uh, tetraethyl paraphenylene diamine, can lose an electron gives up an electron relatively easily. It becomes this cation, which is dark blue. Also, can lose another electron and form this purely what we call quinoidal form. Okay, quinoidal, basically we have these exo double bonds, double bonds within the ring. And in the time frame, in a really relatively small time frame, this compound is stable, and I can put the electron back, and I can put the other electron back, and go back to this aromatic form of this compound. So I go from the aromatic form to the quinoidal form. So I, so I do this in two steps. The steps are somewhat far apart. The further apart they are, the better, because as we'll talk about, we're only going to go to the, we're only, we only want to do this first step, because that first step is extremely stable. Second step is a little bit less stable, but it's reasonably stable. So this does it giving up an electron. Well, everybody knows now when we talk about oxidation reduction chemistry, if I do an oxidation, right, I'm giving up an electron, this is an oxidation, right? If I do an oxidation, I also have to do a reduction. So I need to find a material that I can reduce. Well, it turns out this compound, uh, it's called a viologen. And if I just have two methyl groups here, carbon here and carbon here with three hydrogens, that's called paraquat. Um, this compound now can add an electron. It can be electrochemically reduced. So I have something I can oxidize. I have something that I can reduce. If I put them together, and again, this guy can be reduced once. It can be reduced twice. Again, to this quinoidal form. You can go back, go back. Again, this is reasonably stable. This is very stable, and this is very stable. So I have a compound that I can oxidize, a compound that I can reduce. I put them together in what's called a single compartment, one solution, I put them all together in one solution. I put a couple of electrodes together, and that's how this device is made. That's how these mirrors are made. There's two pieces of glass with electrodes on each piece of glass. I apply a small potential, and again, I oxidize my my anodic material, I reduce what's called the cathodic material. It's called anodic material because it goes to the anode. Cath cathodic material goes to the cathode. So here I am. Here's a, here's a cartoon of this. Here's my anodic material. Again, it's colorless. My, my cathodic material, again, is colorless. I apply a potential. They go to the electrodes. They get oxidized, they get reduced, they form these colored compounds. Now it turns out that out at Gentex they have a compound that turns green when it gets oxidized. 
and a compound that turns blue, and it turns out that those are somewhat complementary colors, so we end up with a nice neutral colored device. Now, these materials stay in solution. They, don't depo they aren't deposited or anything else. They stay in solution, they diffuse away from those electrodes, and when they get close together, Basically, that electron that I took out of the anodic material and put into the cathodic material gets spontaneously transferred back. So I regenerate now my cathodic material and my anodic material. So you saw that while I, when I removed the potential from my, from my window, it started to clear, okay? And it did that spontaneously. And these are referred to as single compartment self-erasing solution phase devices. It's all in one solution. They spontaneously erase, and they're electrochromic. So, some other kinds of chemistry that have been ha, has been developed. And John Reynolds, when he was down at Florida, he's now at Georgia Tech, has done a lot of work with this compound called ethylene dioxythiophene. He's made polymers where basically he links these guys through this position and this position. And when he makes polymers, and this slide just did not work out here, but what ha what's happening here is he's putting a bunch of different co-monomers, co a bunch of different monomers to make copolymers, and he's been able to make this entire palette of colors using these compounds based on this dioxythiophene molecule. Unfortunate. That's unfortunate, that didn't work for me. Um, so the way these devices work, they're polymers, they're stuck to the electrode. So I put a transparent conducting electrode again. I put my, my po electrochromic polymer. I have ions that flow again. This is sort of like the tungsten oxide device. And the electrons flow the opposite way. And again, I am able to attenuate the light that's transmitted through this device, okay? So that's electrochromism. There's a couple of different ways we do it, or that it's been being done. And again, within 20 miles of where we're, 25 miles of where we're standing, 90% of the electrochromic devices in the world are being produced. Uh, another company has done this idea where what they do is they take these nanostructured materials. There are little balls here that are uh, nanostructured. TiO2, titanium dioxide. Um, these are tin oxide, uh, dope tin oxide beads. Uh, these compounds, this modified biologin with this phosphate group, and this phosphate group attached to this um, uh, phenothiazole will stick to these things, and basically that's, these are the guys making uh, displays right now. Basically what they're doing is they're taking these modified electrodes uh, they're putting a diffuser behind them so that they scatter light so that light doesn't, isn't transmitted, but they can color and clear these uh, layers so they go from white to dark. So they act like display, so they are displays. And they can do this on flexible substrates. So these are the guys trying to commercialize these flexible substrate kinds of devices, display devices. So companies producing electrochromic devices, Gentex here in Michigan, there in Zeeland. Sage is a company that makes the windows. They use this tungsten oxide technology. Uh, they're located in Faribault, Minnesota. Uh, Magna has a plant here in Michigan. It used to be the Donnelly Corporation. VIEW also makes these uh, tungsten oxide electrochromic devices. And Antera the, are the people who developed this um, modified, this TiO2 modified electrode kinds of devices, okay? So photochromism. I have a material here, or a device here. This is gonna take a second. And this is a photochromic material. And photochromic materials, again, change colors based on, based on light. And if I, when this guy gets going, can now take and charge it. And you can see now that based just on the light out of my uh, camera shutter or my camera flash, I've been able to color this, at least a portion of this device. 
Th this technology is often used in, or commonly used in transition lenses, so the photochromic sunglasses. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And again, picture of the sunglasses. Basically, the chemistry involved here is this opening, ring opening of the spiropyran form. Leuco basically means, leuco means colorless, and this is the colored form. With the absorption of UV light, this thing goes from this colorless form to this colored form. Okay? So that's, so we can have a bunch of different compounds that have slightly different absorption spectra, and we can make a gray device with a bunch of different, with several different, these spiropyran dyes involved. Another company out in uh, British Columbia has developed this technology uh, where basically they make these thiophene rings on UV. They close this ring, and now we've gone from this limited conjugation system to this extended conjugation system. And of course, Huckel's rules tell us that the more extended the conjugation system is, the longer the wavelengths it will absorb. So this absorbs in the UV, this absorbs in the visible. And so we absorb UV light, visible light will send it back. And they're working on ways to trap this so that they can make photochromic devices that stay colored in, the, in sunlight. And again, here's the structure, basic structure of a photochromic device. We have a substrate, we have our photochromic layer, and then we have a protective coating and a scratch resistance layer, or scratch resistant layer. And that's how those, that's how those guys are put together. Uh, again, companies that do this, Corning, uh, Vision Ease, Transition is probably the most popular. Uh, Switch are the guys with the thiophene chemistry in British Columbia. Th thermochromism. Thermochromism is the change of color with temperature. And again, one of the bigger players in this game is not too far away from here. Um, we've all seen examples of this, right? We've seen coffee cups where you pour coffee in and you, you change the color of your coffee mug or you have these digital or you have these thermometers. A lot of this is what we call thermotropic materials. Um, these are LCDs that basically get reorganized when they, when, as the temperature changes coffee cups with signage. One of the thermochromic uh, compounds or ideas that I want to talk about more in depth here is what we call ligand exchange thermochromism. And in ligand exchange thermochromism, I start with a low metal ligand complex, low epsilon metal ligand complex. And it happens to be octahedral. So I've got these oxygens associated with this metal ion. And the two most popular ones, or the two, two metal ions that work the best are cobalt and nickel, okay? So I've got a metal ion, I've got, I've got it surrounded with ligands, and it's an octahedral complex, so it's got an octahedral geometry. As the temperature increases, if I happen to have halides around, iodine is, the best one, I can change from this octahedral complex to a tetrahedral complex. And I will go from a low extinction coefficient complex to a high extinction complex. Now, notice high extinction 200 to 2,000 is not con generally considered very high. Several thousand, 10,000 is much better, 20,000 is better. But they're left, they're stuck with these 200 to 2,000, and most of them are down around more close, closer to 200 than they are 2,000. But they can change colors. What happened here? This isn't working very well. I'll let that sit for a little while. They, can ch they change colors when we, as the temperature increases or decreases. So what's going on? Well, we all know delta G is delta H minus T delta S. We all know that if delta G is positive, we're gonna have a system that wants to go towards reactants. As delta G becomes more negative, we have a system that wants to go towards products. So that tells us that we need a system 
that has a, has a delta H that's positive and a delta G that's positive. Because we want, we want the reactants to be favored at low temperature, the products to be favored at high temperature. Okay? And so if delta G, if delta H is positive, this term is small, delta G is positive, we favor reactants. If this term starts to dominate over this term, then we start to have a product favored system. We start to favor products, okay? So one of the things we can do is we can do some calculations, some sample calculations to see based on the value of delta H, what can my ratio of the equilibrium constant at 85 versus 25 degrees C be? And it turns out that the higher delta H, the greater this contrast is. Okay, so as delta H goes up, so we, what we want is we want systems that have high delta H's. And remember, delta H is basically the heat energy of the system. Okay? So again, high delta H Comp, or high delta H systems tend to give us higher um, ratios. Now, for a given delta H, the higher the delta S, the lower the temperature at which I can see this transition occur, right? Since delta H minus T delta S is delta G. So again, if I have a delta H of 60 kilojoules per mole, a delta S of 180 joules per mole per degree, I can get a transit, I can get a fairly low temperature transition. I can have this thing go from basically zero absorbance at zero degrees C to absorbance of four to 100 degrees C using the cell spacings and if I have this 280 epsilon and certain concentrations, okay? So applications, this is the, uh, this is Pleotint's offices in Jenison, Michigan, and somehow they found a sunny day in Michigan in the winter. I don't know how they did that, but anyway, you can see that the sun is shining on this window, these windows, but not on this one. You can actually see around the edges where, they're, where, they're, where the uh, siding is shading the window where the window's not darkened. So this is all related to the heat of the sun shining on the window, the window darkens automatically. So there's no wiring. The disadvantage is that you can't control it, okay? The advantage is that there's no wiring to it. And these guys are very proud of the work that they've done. Um, they talk about the temperature um, during the day basically changes depending on the position of the window. So if the window's facing east, the temperature is gonna be highest in the morning. And so we have this lower transmission in the morning. And then as we get into the afternoon, the sun's no longer shining on that side of the building. The windows lighten up. We let more natural daylight into that part of the building. South facing window, again, now towards the middle of the day is when the transmission gets lower. West in the evening or afternoon, the transmission gets lowest. Now you see east, south, west. Notice that out in the west, is where the t transmission actually gets the lowest, and you can, you can certainly understand that. That's basically the hottest part of the day in the summertime, right? Four in the afternoon, sun's out there. So that's, that's their technology. And again, they have a, quite a number of uh, installations. And again, here's the tinted windows. Here's the windows without the direct sunlight. They're clear, so there's Dark interior, clear there. Again, another installation, basically automatically adjusting. Uh, and then here's a morning and afternoon. Again, morning, this is an east facing window, so morning it's dark, evening it, or afternoon it's light. And they call this suntuitive. And this is an eco smart house, and I included this slide because it happens to be in Bozeman, which is where Montana State University is located. And you can see the mountains in the background. I never got used to that. The other technology, I, oh, and the other thing I want to show you is here's an example of thermochromis. This is a pleotint device. You can see this half of the device was in boiling water or in hot water. You can see it's darker 
than this half of the device that wasn't in the hot water. Okay? So basically just changing the equilibrium based on temperature. The other thing that people have done is what's called polymer dispersed liquid crystals. And this is going to be just a 30,000 feet def or description because I happen to have a d demonstration. Basically what I have is I have polymers with liquid crystals spread out in them. And when I, without a field, they're or randomly oriented, and so the devices are scattering. If I turn on an electric field, which is what I'm going to do when I push this button, that window, those, those randomly oriented liquid crystals become aligned. This device becomes transparent. You can see through it. You can see my cup of coffee through it. And if I, whereas it's not when it's when the power's off. So, Dilbert knows windows. Um, he's going to get a new cubicle. It's got a support beam in it, but he has a window view. Uh, it's 43 degrees C. Um, those of you who are familiar with room temperature know that 43 degrees C is quite a bit above that. But there's a breeze from the people who walk by and laugh, and Dogbert has absolutely no compassion for him, it's no sympathy at all. But he's dog bird. Uh, why do you keep closing the blinds? Glare. This is the other thing about having windows. If you've ever had an office with a window, the sun shines, you can't see. If you try to watch TV with the, with the sun shining on your television, you can't see it. Well, screen glare. Well, Alice doesn't care because she's not, her office or her cubicle doesn't happen, happen to be right in the line of sight. And so employees fight about this all the time. Uh, some thank yous, um, Harlan Biker at Pleotent, who did a lot of the development, both for the electrochromic system that I described from Gentex, as well as the thermochromic system I, I described at Pleotent. And also thanks to you for your attention. That was... Uh quite a bit over my head being a biologist, but you guys, <laughs> chemists here, you probably know more about this stuff. But uh, anyway, uh, does anybody have any questions for Dr. Teisty that they would like to ask him? Um, anything? Do we have anything? Yes. Oh, uh, take the... a little bit about what a liquid crystal is and how it aligns? Yeah, liquid crystals are liquids and crystals, um, but basically they have these permanent dipole moments, and so they're like magnets. So think about a magnet. If I put a magnet in an electric field, it's going to orient itself so that the positive end of the magnet is going to be assigned, aligned with the negative, or associated with the negative pole of, a, of an electrode, and vice versa. So that's, sort of, that's what these guys are. So think about them as long magnets that can either be randomly oriented or they can all be oriented in the same direction if I apply a field to them. OK? Anything else? Yeah? So LPDs don't have any sort of redox No. No, they are what we call field effect devices. It's basically what, you know, if you go to the gas pump, those are all LCDs. Basically what they're doing is they're basically orienting themselves in an electric field or not. Okay. Yeah? Um, the application of plane, um, I guess, what are some advantages of using that versus having uh, to pull down the old First is weight. Okay. That pull down shade has this huge metal <laughs> carrier that it sits in. The other one is when Boeing designed the 787, they de designed the windows so big that a pull-down shade couldn't fit within the curvature of the aircraft. Remember, you're sitting basically inside a tube. So that if the, in order to make that shade flat, it wasn't going to fit within the, within, the, within the plane. And the, other, the third advantage is now the flight attendants can say, I don't want people opening and closing shades at their, at their 
seats while somebody's trying to watch a movie and we want it to be dark and people are sleeping. So somebody can go to the main console and they can say, no windows can be above this transmission level. Boeing has set five transmission levels for the windows. And so what, what they can do is they can say, none of the windows can be above this transmission level and so we can keep the plane nice and dark. The other thing is they want all the windows open and clear for landing. So the flight attendant can go to the console for landing, doesn't have to wake somebody up to lift their shade. It's a, it can in some ways, yes. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep, yep. And they can do that. They, they just do that. The flight attendants can do that from a central console. OK. Anything else? Uh, Dr. Tice, to you another round of applause. Thank you.